Our first speaker is Jess, and uh, she's postgrad in uh, biology, and so we're going to hear about nematodes, worms, and neuroscience. Hi everyone, I hope you're having a good day at the Science Cafe. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about little tiny microscopic worms, specifically what we can learn about the brain from little tiny microscopic worms. So a little bit about me. I grew up in Toronto in Canada where it snows a lot more than it does here. Um, and in Toronto, I studied biochemistry at the University of Toronto, which really means studying the little tiny chemical molecules that make up all living things in biology. But I was interested in more complex living systems, animals, brains, organs, that kind of thing. Emphasis on brains. So I came to Yale University to do research in neuroscience as a uh, postgrad researcher. So that brought me to this question that I study and a lot of people study in labs at Yale and around the world. What can we learn about the brain from a microscopic worm? So this might sound kind of out there. Um, so we're just going to go right to the beginning. Why do we want to study the brain at all? Do any of you have any thoughts on why we might want to study the brain? Yes. Yes, definitely. Great reason. Yeah. So we can understand how our minds work? Yeah, so we can understand how our minds work. Yep. Yep, disease, problems, something like that, sure. Yeah, we'd have problems if, if the brain didn't work right. That's exactly right. And one more. Um, so that would understand different amount of usage of different things. Yeah. Okay. All really, really good reasons for studying the brain. And uh, exactly like a couple of you said, we want to understand behavior and thought. The brain is the thing that kind of supports and, and creates all animal behavior, all thought, everything that goes on in our minds and the minds of, of uh, animals. Uh, and that's really interesting to understand. It's a very complex organism. We also want to understand brain diseases, things that can go wrong specifically in the brain and how we can maybe understand them so we can treat them, maybe one day even cure them. And finally, there's a technological interest in the brain, especially you know more and more these days um, between things like artificial intelligence and brain machine interfaces. We have to understand the biological realities governing the brain in order to connect it with technology. So we have to ask, again, yes, you have a question? Um, I think it's, it's typically considered an organ within the human organism, but that's, uh, that's a very good philosophical question. Um, yeah. Good, good question. It's, it really depends on how you define things. Um, okay, general questions I think we'll, we'll keep to the end. So there will be a period for you guys to ask general questions. So what is the brain made of? You've probably seen a picture that looks something like this of the whole brain. Um, all these kind of folded up little bits like this, this kind of squishy, gooey thing. Um, you might also have seen pictures that look something like this, highlighting specific regions of the brain that are thought to in some way support specific different types of behavior and thought. But what I'm going to be talking about is this aspect of what the brain is made of, the really fundamental material of the brain, brain cells or neurons. So when we talk about neurons, we can talk about a few different levels of organization. The neurons themselves, every neuron is kind of a world of its own. We want to understand things that are going on inside neurons in order to understand the bigger picture of the brain later on. We want to understand synapses. I think there was a, a demo on synapses, so you guys might have learned a bit about that. Um, this is the way that two neurons will talk to each other. And we, of course, want to understand that because that's how we get networks and the functionality of the entire brain as a whole with all these neurons communicating and talking to each other. If every neuron is an individual, then a synapse is like two people having a conversation and a network is like a whole group of people or a whole city of people. Um, creating some emergent thought or behavior out of all those interactions. 
But we run into some problems when we want to study neurons in the human brain. So one of the first really, really big problems is that we can't actually see into living human brains at the scale of neurons because all this stuff is in the way. If you take a microscope and you put it to the head of a person to try to see the neurons of the person, what are you going to see? Yeah, you're going you're to see the head. You're going to see the skull. You might see nothing. Um, you're, you're not able to access the brain inside a, a living human being this way. Yep. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's a good point. And there are um, kind of post-mortem ways that you can study human brains. And we have learned a lot about human brains by studying exactly dead people. Um, but that's really, that's kind of a, that's not a live brain, right? If we're interested in studying processes and communication and networks that are going on inside a person's brain while they're thinking, we can't wait until after they die. We're, we're interested in living neurons. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, that is true. Um, again, we're, we're going to save, save questions till the end, so keep your questions till the end. Um, the other problem, the other big problem, other than the fact that we can't really see living neurons, is that even if we could, the human brain is way, way, way too complex. So, again, if we think of these networks of neurons as groups of people talking to each other, the population of New York City is almost 10 million people. And that's way too much to, to try to analyze and comprehend and understand the ways that all of those people might be talking and interacting. Does anyone know how many neurons are in the human brain approximately? Yes. Um, billions? It is billions. Who thinks it's one billion? Who thinks it's five billion? Who thinks it's at least 10 billion? Who thinks it's at least 50 billion? What about 100 billion? What about 500 billion? Okay, so the human brain contains about 100 billion neurons to our current knowledge, which is 10,000 times the population of that huge city where you can't understand what's going on if you tried. So this level of complexity just you know, makes it really, really hard to study the human brain on this scale of neurons. Enter the worm. This little nematode that I was telling you about before. C. elegans. It is very cute. Thank you for saying that. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of how big this, this, this tiny, tiny, tiny little worm is, I've shown it next to a penny up there on the screen. It is about one millimeter in size. It is about one millimeter long in size. Um, it has only 302 neurons per adult worm compared to the 100 billion I talked about in humans. Its body is completely transparent. All it really does is swim around, eat food, and reproduce. So what am I possibly talking about? What in the world could this tiny little worm have in common with people? What could it tell us about the brain, and how could it help us overcome those problems that I talked about before? So... Here's how. The body of the worm is completely transparent, like I mentioned. So the problem that you get trying to look through a human skull into the brain, you don't get that problem. You can see right through the skin, and you can see all of its cells. Over there, you can see some, some cells of the worm already, just in this kind of blown-up image. And the complexity problem isn't really that much of a problem anymore. You're not, under, you're not trying to understand 10,000 New York cities. You're maybe trying to understand, like, a large room of people, like something more approximate, uh, approximating this room of people, which is a lot easier to do. It's still a challenge, but it's, it's you know, within our capabilities. So now that we kind of have this organism that we can, we know that we can see its neurons, we can understand the amount of complexity present in its brain, we can find principles that govern the way its brain works, that govern the networks present in the brain, and we can do that through microscopy. So you guys might have learned a little bit about microscopy today. And this is a view that you get of a worm under a microscope, just 
under a light microscope, nothing fancy. You can clearly see a lot of the cells there. Some of them are labeled. And you can also see in the head of the worm the kind of worm equivalent of a brain. But, oops, sorry. But, so there, there's still a problem here, though. Can you guys see any neurons? Do you guys think you can see any neurons? No. There's so much stuff going on in a worm's body. Even something as simple as that has so many different types of cells. We have so many different types of cells. Um, you know, even if we were totally transparent, it would be pretty hard to, to make out what was going on um, with like all the three-dimensional structure of a biological body. So the solution to that problem is to engineer specific cells of the worm to glow with fluorescent light. So um, what we can do is, is we've developed techniques to basically, um, yeah, fluorescently tag any specific type of cell or multiple specific types of cells inside the worm's body so that we can distinguish where things like neurons are or where specific cell types are. You know, if you compare this view on the left with the view on the right, you can see much more clearly into whatever you're specifically trying to see. And that leads to some really, really cool visuals and some really cool pictures um, where you can get all these worms that look all kinds of colors, like Christmas trees, um, depending on what you're tagging and, and where. And again, I just want to emphasize, these are living worms. They're not dead. They're fully alive. They're functioning. They're behaving. They're thinking. They're communicating. Um, and we can look at their neurons while they do that. So this sets us up really, really well to answer this question. What can we learn about the brain from a microscopic worm? And again, we have our levels of organization of the brain that we talked about. Hopefully you guys didn't forget yet. We have our neurons, we have our synapses, we have our networks. So how do we use this little worm, this little nematode, to understand how these things all work? So again, with that fluorescent tagging technique that I talked about earlier, you can tag individual neurons and watch them behave. This video shows those kind of like long uh, green lines are the neurons of the worm. And you can see them moving and growing and talking in real time. That's kind of creepy. It's pretty creepy, um, but it's also really cool. Um, yes. That's, this is like a, it's like a sped up um, video that someone took of a worm's neuron. Okay. So yeah, and you can also, you can tag different types of neurons because there's all kinds of different types of neurons in human brains, worm brains, and so on. Um, and yeah, like this sets us up really well to look at neurons and understand what neurons are doing individually. Um, yeah, that's just another view of, of tagging basically all the neurons in the worm's body because, you know, Neurons go all through your body. They're not just in your head, in your brain. You have nerves everywhere. That's how you can feel. That's how you can move around. Um, your brain really kind of extends through your whole body. And for synapses, we can also specifically fluorescently tag synapses themselves. So this little point of communication where the neurons are talking to each other, we can tag that and look at it. And that's what you see. Those little green dots there are synapses. And we can watch their behavior also in real time. Um, and using these tools that we now have, we can look at neurons, we can look at synapses, we can look at how neurons behave and how they communicate. We can answer a lot of really important questions fundamental to those things that we talked about earlier, behavior and thought, disease, technology. We can ask how neurons grow and develop in the brain, in maybe like a developing embryo or a baby, um, or even an adult, because we constantly are, are growing new neurons through our lives. Um, and this is work done in the Colin Ramos lab at Yale, which is the lab I work in, um, showing the growth and development of early neurons in the brain of the worm. And this video that we saw earlier is a video uh, from the Hammerland lab, also at Yale University, showing how when the end of a neuron is cut off, so that end of the neuron has been cut off right there that you see on kind of the bottom, and it's growing back, it's growing back to reconnect with its neighbor. So the fact that we can observe a process like that in worms and ask how it happens could have really huge implications if we could translate that to the human brain. 
and human brain regeneration or neuron growth on a really basic level. We can also ask questions about disease. Again, really fundamental cellular level disease. What genes help to keep neurons healthy and what goes wrong in disease? So the Hillard lab in uh, Australia, these worms are all over the world, they're everywhere, um, found this piece of DNA in the worm that when it's mutated, when something's wrong with that piece of DNA, the neuron doesn't grow all the way like it should. It kind of stops part way. And when we find pieces of DNA like that, we can ask, firstly, why do they have that effect? What are the factors that allow the neuron to grow correctly? And how can we you know, like manipulate those maybe? And we can also ask, are there any genes, are there any pieces of DNA that look like this in humans that are kind of homologous, you could say, in, in genetic language in humans? And do they cause problems in humans? And how can we help fix those problems once we've identified their cause? And here's kind of the cool part. This is kind of like a cool, very um, current, ongoing aspect of C. elegans biology. We can map all of the networks of the brain. Like I said before, 302 neurons, that's a lot. 300 is a lot of things like to actually try to understand by yourself. But with a lot of work from a lot of people and the help of computers, uh, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, the Emmons Laboratory and many collaborators were able to create this really, really crazy looking map, which is very, very indecipherable as it is. But what it shows is the networks of communication between every single neuron of the worm that we've observed in living, functioning worms. And this is pretty crazy looking. Um, don't try to like understand what's going on here. But what this allows us to then do is create a model of a worm digitally. So you've seen, you've probably seen, you know, like video games before, you've seen simulations. If you have a character in a video game, it looks like a person, it's moving around. What, do you think that that is kind of like a, a thinking entity? Do you think that's like a, it's based on biology? Nope. Yeah, it's, it's programming. It's not, it, it, it's sort of designed to act like what a person might act like if you press certain buttons, but it's not really based on what a person actually is and how a person is actually, you know, made. Um, but with this group, Open Worm, this is a group that has used the type of what's called connectomics data, so information about connections between cells. They are working on using this data to create a worm simulation in a computer that, it might not look super exciting because it's just a worm crawling around, but what's behind it is really, really exciting. What's behind it is information about the actual biological structure and networks that give rise to real life living worms. And this is like the very first time that we're going to be able to simulate an animal with kind of true faith to biology. It, it's, you, it, it's something that might as well be a real living worm, but inside a computer. Um, and we can, we have all these like complicated 3D maps and models of everything going on inside the body of the worm. And this is the only organism that we can do this with right now. And you know, who knows what's in the future. And what is in the future? What is next for the worm? C. elegans for our nematode. You guys might be the ones to find out. There's so much complexity in this worm and in other models in nature. As much as we kind of live in a pretty digital age, like, you know, I'm sure you guys are all on computers all the time and stuff. Um, we can always turn to biology to understand secrets of complexity and networks and uh, cells and systems that have evolved over so many billions of years that, you know, we're not going to come up with anything as cool as a worm just from scratch without already having a worm or, or a living animal in front of us. So, and yeah, maybe you guys will be the ones to, to venture out and find new biological models that can help us understand our, ourselves, understand reality, and connect with technology in new ways that no one's even thought of yet. So, inside the minds of nematodes, we can find all kinds of answers to the question, what can we learn about the brain from a microscopic worm? So thank you guys for listening. That's what I have to say. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jess, for presenting this amazing presentation. So we have time for three questions. Yeah. Um, so raise your hand if you have a question. All right, I'll give. Thanks. Um, so how, are there any other animals that you have st that would, that you think would, or have already used for studying the brain and neurons and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, I've actually, on this slide, shown some of the most common models in biology. Um, we use all kinds of model organisms for all kinds of things that are easier to study than people or that we just want to understand for themselves because things like worms and plants and mice are really interesting by themselves. Um, the most common models uh, in terms of other organisms than humans for studying the brain are probably mice, um, nematodes, fruit flies, sometimes a specific type of transparent fish. There's a lot of new work being done on transparent jellyfish, similar to C. elegans, and there's all kinds of other stuff out there. So maybe you'll be the one to discover the next big model organism. You have a question over here. Okay. What's the most important part of the brain? Sorry, could you say that again? What's the most important part of the brain? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would say as kind of like a system biologist, I think the whole brain. I don't think there's any most important part of the brain. I think for humans, we often think about the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex as the part of the brain that's really unique to humans um, and that gives that seems to give us our the, the type of intelligence that, that we, we recognize in humans. Um, but the whole brain is important. Every nerve that goes through every part of your body is part of this whole um, the brain and the body can't live without each other. No part of the brain can live without another part of the brain. So I think the whole brain is the, is the most important part. Aside from the word worm's brain being easy to decipher because it has a low number of uh, neurons, uh, why did you pick this animal to decipher and to make the connection to a human brain? Um, I mean, I personally study the worm because it's been so well studied. There's such a huge wealth of information that we already have about the worm. All the work of like knowing where every single cell in the entire body of the worm has been done in like the 1970s, you know, forever ago. Um, it's, there's like a huge community of scientists that study worms all around the world. It's a really great community. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's just like the best, most easily available and most kind of um, interesting model for studying the brain at a really, really single cell level, which is what I'm interested in. What part of the brain helps you balance? Helps you balance? Um, that's actually a really interesting question. So um, what helps us balance is not exactly in the brain. It's connected to the brain, but there are actually kind of little tiny um, like stones in your ears this sounds crazy, but there are little tiny stones in your ears that float in fluid, and depending on how they're oriented, how your ears are oriented, that tells you whether you're facing up or down or leaning or whatever. And th those stones talk to your brain and tell your brain um, if you're balancing or not. But that's, that's a great question. It's, it's not 100% to do with the brain. All right. Thank you so much, Jess, for answering those awesome questions. Thank you, guys. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, telling you guys about some of the stuff I'm working on. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be today talking about AI, biology, superheroes, and medicines, and how all of these things are actually related. There we go. So before I begin, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm from New York, and I'm a PhD student here at Yale. And some of the things that I like are pizza, guitar, chess, and science. And yeah, I was told that you guys like science as well, so I'm going to stick with that for the talk, and this is going to be it for the pizza. So who here likes Spider-Man? Okay, a lot of you guys like Spider-Man. Cool. So Spider-Man's going to be a large part of my talk today. So does anyone know how Spider-Man got his powers? Perfect. Bit by a spider, as you can see. So let's think. What, generally speaking, what must have happened between the spider and Spider Man for him to get his powers? Probably 
Yeah, so. Exactly. So what must have happened is that the spider transferred some type of material to Peter Parker to turn him into Spider-Man. So the billion dollar question, which is going to be the focus of this talk, is can we figure out how to make biological stuff that improves human function similarly to the stuff that the spider injected into Spider-Man to give him his cool powers? So what is biological stuff? I'm going to focus on two types of things. Now, we have proteins, which are molecules in the body that carry out all types of different functions. For example, there's hemoglobin, which operates in red blood cells to transfer oxygen. Does anyone know any other kinds of proteins? Or? Yeah, so, yeah, so different, there are many different types of deficiencies that have to do with proteins not working that call, cause all sorts of problems. So, yeah, just know that proteins are things that carry out functions in the body. And then there are also drugs that pharmaceutical companies will make and things like this. And what drugs do, mostly, is they'll bind to proteins and cause some change in the protein and therefore change something that happens in the body. And a simple example of this is Tylenol binding to proteins that cause inflammation, thus reducing inflammation. So what are some kinds of examples of things that we as scientists can do with the, th the knowledge we have regarding proteins and drugs? So we can engineer proteins to improve specific functions, such as the case of Spider-Man with his powers, and we can develop drugs to cure specific diseases. So say if there is some protein that causes cancer, we can develop a drug that binds to this protein and therefore halts the cancer. So how can we make these things? In the past and somewhat now also, but this is moving away with time, People would try a bunch of different things. They'll, they'll work with a lot of chemicals through trial and error, see what things work with their knowledge of chemistry and biology and things like this, mostly working with real chemicals. But now we have the ability to actually leverage artificial intelligence to accomplish this much faster. So... What is AI, artificial intelligence? Does anyone have any idea by any chance? Yeah. Who, whoever wants to, go ahead. Kind of like a more advanced system of technology. Um, and this is supposed to be based on movies and all facts that can, like, kind of, like, um, up to now we've needed humans to, like, program technology, but it can, like, think for itself and actually do stuff, which the movies have manipulated Yeah, yep, yeah, that, that's a great, that's a great answer. So, basically... So basically, AI, simply put, the way we can think of it here, is some type of program that's running on a computer that understands or has knowledge about how to answer a specific question where the rules are defined. So it's sort of, training an AI model is sort of like training a dog. But instead of training a dog where if it does something good, you give it a treat, when the AI model acts the way you want it to act, you tell it it's doing good, and then it will act this way in the future. And this is simple, but it, it'll, it'll work for now. So who here has heard of ChatGPT? Everyone. OK. That's, that's, uh, that's nice to hear. Someone said? OK, I thought someone said something. So yeah, so ChatGPT is super cool in my opinion. So here, I ask it. Write me a poem about Spider-Man and pizza as if written by Dr. Seuss. Can you guys read it from there? Oh, maybe. So, in a city so big with buildings so tall, there swings a hero, the bravest of all, Spider-Man, Spider-Man in his suit so red, swinging through skies above every head. Not, not bad. So I'm actually going to open up ChatGPT, and we're going to test it out. So I'm signed into my account here, and... 
We're going to ask ChatGPT some questions just so whoever has no familiarity with ChatGPT can gain some before we move forward. So I'm going to ask it to write a poem. Who has any suggestion for what type of poem or what, what we should uh, ask it to give us? Yep. Let's ask something that everyone knows about, <laughs> just, so that, just so that this could be super clear for everyone. Uh, yeah. Um, write, a write a poem about how bad white chocolate is and how good dark chocolate is. Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> I'm offended, Allison. How bad? Wait, how bad, how bad, how bad what chocolate is? White. Okay, as you can see, it answers instantly with a poem. White chocolate, oh so pale, in the chocolate world, you often fail. <laughs> Your sweetness overwhelms, I must confess, leaving taste buds in a sugary mess. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So, yeah, as you can see, works super fast. Now let's get back to the science. So... What if, oh, thanks. So what if instead of having chat GPT generate for us text, such as a poem, here you see, oops, sorry about that. Here, <laughs> here you see the Spider-Man poem that I was reading before. What if instead of having it generate text, it generates new molecules? So rather than training it on text to generate text, what if we can train it on molecules to generate molecules. So here you see water, methane, ethanol, etc. So, so are you telling me that there is an AI model that can make proteins, that, that can make molecules that bind to any protein we want? Thinking, thinking like, okay, can we just use ChatGPT to make us drugs? No, this is too complicated because proteins are really complicated. But what we can do is make a ton of molecules. Let's say we generate a trillion molecules. Then we could check all of them and see if they bind to a protein that we're interested in. So basically, it would be crazy to test a trillion molecules. And no scientist is going to want to do this. So the solution is we need a way to generate molecules that are specific to a protein that we are interested in targeting. So on the left here, you see this thing here is a little potential drug, and the bigger thing is the protein, and they're not binding. But on the right, we have a drug that's binding to a protein. So how can we go from the left to the right? That's the question here. So I came up with a method to do this, and that's what I'm going to discuss briefly. So the first step is to use an AI model to generate a ton of different molecules. Next, for each molecule that's generated, you calculate a ton of different properties, such as how much the molecule weighs, is it charged, how many atoms does it have, etc. Then you group similar molecules together, such that molecules in the same group share similar properties. Does this make sense to everyone? Yep, awesome. And then the next step is to sample only 1% of the molecules from each group. And this would be 100 times faster than sampling all of them. And then we test only these 1% with the protein we are interested in to see if it binds. And like I said, I'm going to reiterate because this is an important point. This is 100 times faster than testing all of the generated molecules. Then what we do is, let's say we test one of the molecules in the red group. And it scores really well with the protein. It binds to the protein. What we will do is sample from the red group 
and give it to the model to teach it to generate molecules like the ones in the red group. And let's say the one we sample in the green group is bad, we won't show it anything from the green group. And this is sort of like going to a buffet. So imagine you're really hungry, you go to a buffet, and there are like 10 different stations, right? The first time you go, you sort of test everything out, but then the next round, you have a better idea what you want, so you sort of go right to that spot rather than messing with like the vegetables and you know stuff like that. Go straight, straight for the french fries. So yeah, congratulations. This was an example of active learning in artificial intelligence, and now you've learned an example of this. And also a little bit about protein engineering and drug discovery. And yeah, you guys really need to know that this is a unique time in human history because with the internet, with the internet, with the emerging technologies and AI, there are all of these tools that are free and easy to use and easily accessible that any of you can use, any of you can learn. And the barrier to entry to become a scientist, to work on exciting problem, problems is very low. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. All right, we're passing the mic around, so just raise your hand, and we we'll, can ask questions. Thank you. So, you're, so like, if we, in the future, like, could there be people that have, like, the, like, the powers or characteristics of a certain animal, like Spider-Man in the movies? I don't have any reason to say that it's impossible. <laughs> this, if it were the case, you know, this is going to raise a lot of questions as to whether or not we want to turn people into animals. <laughs> Although, it's an interesting question to pursue. And I'm sure there are some people working on stuff that's similar to this, if I had to guess. <laughs> I mentioned this before, but um, do you think, like, everything Hollywood makes of AI, like Avengers Age of Ultron and Terminator and all that, do you think, like, at, there is a real danger of stuff like that actually happening? So, that's a great question. So, you can think, like, yeah, because these things are in Hollywood, they're probably ridiculous. My opinion is that some of the predictions that are first made in science fiction films are, it's scary how accurate some of the predictions turn out to be. And some people will make the case that science fiction is an early form of science, and it sort of paves the way with ideas that are often pursued. So I'm sure a lot of it is a bit exaggerated. I haven't watched some of the newer movies. But um, a lot of it's very interesting, to say the least. So if, if we teach AI how to make drugs, mm -hmm. can you make drugs that can change our DNA? Absolutely, yeah. So there are technologies that we have. Has anyone heard of CRISPR, Cas9? A few of you. So... Yeah, there's, there's a technology, um, Jennifer Doudna is her name, was actually at Yale not too long ago, won the Nobel Prize for discovering CRISPR. It's a protein that can modify DNA by snipping out parts of it. And you could, you could use this, this is now used in many labs to snip out parts of DNA, put parts in, things like this. And actually, it's funny you ask, because one of the projects I'm working on is to develop drugs that bind to CRISPR to alter its function. So yeah, you can do this. But I'd actually be happy to talk more about this with you after if, if you want to. So, yeah. Last question over here. Um, here. So we all know that if there isn't enough proteins, then it's bad. But what happens when there's too many proteins? Can, can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, so we all know that having not enough proteins is bad, so, and if they don't work, it's also bad, but what happens when there's too many? So if there are too many proteins, what happens? That's a good question. So the way proteins work is 
any given protein will have a role to perform within a specific mechanism. And in order for this mechanism to be carried out properly, it is likely the case that there needs to be the ideal concentration of a given protein. If that concentration is too low, then that mechanism will not occur as much as, as, much as is necessary for proper function. And if there's too much, it may be the case that the protein generates too much product within that reaction. And this can definitely have negative effects. For instance, yeah, I mean, I could, I, I, could, I could talk more about this after if you want, but you don't want to have a specific mechanism occurring with too much product generation. There's always an equilibrium that, that the body seeks to establish. So too much of a protein could definitely lead, lead to overactivity in, in some regard. But again, this is going to depend on like the specific mechanism. But yeah, I'd be happy to talk more about this after. All right, second round of applause for Greg, and we're going to move on to our last speaker. So our last speaker is Nishad, PhD student in physics, and we're going to learn about magnetism. I'll remind everybody at the end we're going to have the raffle too, and then a feedback form. All right, so round of applause for our next speaker. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good? Cool, cool. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about magnetism, uh, which is pretty related to some of my research. But first, I want to tell you a little more about myself. Uh, let's see. Nice. Yeah. OK. Um, cool. So a little bit about me. I started learning physics in high school. And that's when I first uh, you know, saw it in classes and got really interested. Uh, and then in college, I decided to study something called electrical engineering, which is using the physics of electricity and magnetism to build really cool things. So for example, the kind of thing I used to do was uh, build that sort of circuit up there where you see like a battery with some wires hooked up to a circuit board, and it's powering that light bulb over there that's glowing. Uh, and that's like a very simple version of a circuit, but the idea of circuits is the entire basis for modern computers. So underneath that, you can see one of the very first computers that Apple made back in the 70s, way before MacBooks or iPhones or any of that stuff. And it's basically a much bigger version of the circuit up there where you have all these little wires going to different components, talking to each other, communicating, you know, running all your programs, doing all your math. And that's what all computers today are like and what they look like inside. Uh, and so I really like doing that. And now in my PhD, I decided to study quantum computing, which is basically how to build new types of computers using quantum physics, uh, which is really cool. So that thing you see over there is a quantum computer. That's the kind of stuff that I work on. Um, and this is just a little map of where I'm from. So I'm from New Jersey over here near Philadelphia, if you know where that is. Uh, and then this is where I went to school. And now I'm over here. Um, and so, nope, that's the wrong way. All right. A little bit about my hobbies. I really like doing Indian dance. I used to do it in college a lot. I was on a team and we used to perform, which was a lot of fun. Uh, do different styles like Bollywood, if you guys have heard of Bollywood. Uh, more classical styles too. So that was a lot of fun and I still do that now. I also really like doing improv comedy. Oh, nice. You guys know about improv comedy? Okay, cool. It's basically like putting on a comedy show, but you don't know what you're going to say until you get on stage. Yeah, you don't have a script, exactly. So you have to make it all up on the spot, which is a lot of fun. It's really hard, but it's fun. Um, cool. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to go through today. I want to talk about magnetism, what it is. And, you know, I'm sure you guys know a little bit about it and have seen magnets, but we're going to dig a little deeper after that and talk about where it comes from in terms of physics. And then we're going to dig even a little deeper than that, because it turns out most of what is called regular physics or classical physics uh, explains a little bit about magnetism, but it doesn't explain everything. And in order to really understand magnets, you actually have to know about quantum physics, which is what I study, which is the physics of really, really small things like atoms and electrons. You guys have heard of, everyone's heard of atoms? Electrons? Protons? Okay, cool. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some really cool things that people have built over the years using magnets, including a lot of stuff that you might not even realize, 
was built from magnets. Cool. So what is it in a basic way? It's basically magnetism is one of the fundamental forces in our universe, right? Uh, it's a force where you know you have two magnets and you can feel them attract each other or you can feel them push apart on each other and repel. And it's kind of invisible, right? You can't really see any kind of physical connection between the magnets. But we know that it does this and we really want to understand why. Um, and so it's responsible for, you know, your fridge magnets. If you guys have those at home, those stick to your fridges, right? It's responsible for the way a compass works and why you can navigate always going north or south. Um, and it's responsible for how all the electronics in your car work and even how your car is able to drive and move around. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but at a very basic level, in terms of some of the classical physics uh, that people have known about for a couple hundred years now, uh, the idea is that uh, particles like electrons or protons have charge, right? And because they have charge, they create something called an electric field, which is kind of like this invisible force field around the particle that either will push stuff away or pull it closer to the particle. So, for example, a proton over there is positively charged, so it has a field that pushes other protons away and other positive charge away, which is why you see those arrows going out. Um, over here. And then the electron has a negative charge, so that's why you see the uh, arrows push in, because the electron will attract other protons, right? The idea is that uh, the opposite charges attract each other, and then basically types of the same charge will push each other away and repel like this. So protons will push other protons away, electrons will push other electrons away, but protons and electrons will attract each other. And so that's responsible for why we have any atoms at all, really, because the idea is that the electron really likes being around the proton, decides to orbit the proton, and that's how we get elements like hydrogen, helium, carbon, oxygen, all the stuff in our universe is because of this sort of interaction. Um, now, what's really important is that this is sort of how an electric field works, but it doesn't really explain a magnetic field, right? An electron or a proton that's sitting still has an electric field, and it doesn't have any magnetic field, but when it starts to move around, then it gets a magnetic field to generate around it. Um, and so you can see over there if you have like a wire with some current in it, right? Like here, and the electrons are flowing up like this, then the magnetic field is this kind of arrow that's swirling around. And similarly, if you have electrons going in a wire like this where they're looping around and kind of going in a circle, it creates a magnetic field that pushes through the middle of this coil over here. So electric fields and magnetic fields are very much related to each other, and they're kind of based on these electrons that move around. And so this is actually really, really important because it turns out that this is kind of the reason why we have what are called electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic waves. Have you guys heard of electromagnetic waves before? Yeah? Okay, cool. So it basically means you have an electric part, which is like the red part over there, and the magnetic part, which is the blue part over there. And these electromagnetic waves are responsible for everything, including all the light that we get from the sun. All that light is electromagnetic waves. Anything from a light bulb, that's also electromagnetic waves. And uh, what other types of electromagnetic waves are there? Have you, do you guys know any other ones? Yeah? That's true. That's true. A light, any, any kind of light that you see from any source is an electromagnetic wave, but special types of electromagnetic waves have different names, actually. So, for example, does anyone know what that is? An X-ray, exactly, an X-ray. An X-ray is a type of electromagnetic wave. When you go to the doctor and you get a scan like that of your bones, that's because they're sending a specific type of wave at your body, and that shows them information under your skin. Same with the microwave, the thing you guys, I'm assuming everyone knows a microwave. You heat up your food, right? The reason that your food gets hot is because there are microwaves, you know, heating up, going into your food and creating heat. Those are electromagnetic waves too. In fact, it's the same kind of wave in your microwave that is responsible for all your cell communication and, you know, when you call someone and they pick up somewhere on the other end of the world, that's because there's microwaves going from your phone to their phone. So all these different types of waves are super, super important. And they're all different types of electromagnetic waves, uh, including visible light and all those other ones. 
And so that seems to explain a lot, right, about the world and about how magnetism is in the world. But it doesn't actually explain everything, right? Because I'm sure you guys saw out there, you know, there were demos with like bar magnets, right? And uh, you can see like two different magnets that are solid stick together. But those magnets are like solid objects, right? They don't have any electric current flowing through them, right? Otherwise, if you touch them, you would feel the current. You would get shocked. But so classical physics doesn't really explain why this happens. And for that, you actually need quantum physics. And quantum physics tells us that for any or a lot of different particles, like electrons, like protons, and other things, even if they're not moving, they actually still can have a magnetic field. And the reason is that they have something called spin. Has anyone heard of spin? OK. Basically, the idea is imagine you have an electron, and it's kind of spinning around on its axis, right? Just a ball spinning around on its axis, just the, way this, the same way that the Earth does when uh, the Earth goes through a full day, right? This creates a magnetic field, which is the sort of north to south pointing thing over there. That's the field that the electron creates, and that can interact with other atoms and other magnets and pretty much anything else that's magnetic. And so that's really important because basically every atom has a bunch of electrons and a bunch of protons, right? And this also explains, you know, we see certain things are magnetic, but other things are not, right? Does anyone know an example of some solid that's magnetic? Uh, in the back there, yeah. Iron. Iron, exactly, perfect. And does anyone know an example of a solid that isn't magnetic? Yeah, over there. Yeah. Sorry? Steel. Yeah, so certain types of steel are not magnetic. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't magnetic, right? Like your shoe isn't magnetic, or this chair isn't magnetic, right? And so quantum physics explains why certain things are and certain things aren't. And it has to do with the way that the electrons inside of those atoms look. So let's take a look up here at the electrons inside of iron, right? What do we notice? There's a bunch of electrons all in a row, and they all happen to have their spins pointing in the same direction. You guys see all those up arrows? So exactly. So when we have all those spins pointing in the same direction, it creates one big magnetic field. And that's why iron atoms are magnetic. And that's why they can interact with other magnets and stuff like bar magnets we can make. Um, but when we have other materials, you know, like uh, copper, like this penny over here, we have a bunch of different spins, right? Some are pointing up, some are pointing down. What do you guys think happens when the spins are all different? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's no magnetic field because they all cancel each other out, right? You can think of it like one electron is trying to pull on something, but the next electron is trying to push, the next one's trying to pull, and so they all cancel each other out and nothing happens. So that's why stuff like copper, like pennies, isn't magnetic. But maybe if you have a sink or other things, right, like your fridge made of iron, then or you know, other parts, iron and combined with other stuff, it can be magnetic. So that's really important, right? And you can only explain that because of quantum physics. And so I guess you guys probably saw the demo out there. There was a demo with like a bar magnet and some iron filings. Did people see that? Yeah. Well, in case uh, some people did not see that, I will show you real quick if I can find the mouse. Is it this mouse? This one. Okay, cool. Um, basically, what we're going to see is this guy over here is going to take these iron filings, right, which are tiny little pieces of iron, and he's basically just going to sprinkle them kind of randomly on top of this bar magnet, right, which is the big block in the middle. And you can see that even though he is kind of sprinkling them randomly and in any order, they start to form these kind of lines here, right? Does everybody see those lines? Exactly. It's forming a pattern. And that pattern is really similar to that magnetic field over there that you guys can see, right? All those arrows that are pointing from north to south. Kind of similar how in an electric field, the arrows point from positive to negative. Um, and so because uh, that iron is magnetic, we basically get those little pieces of iron to align themselves with the invisible magnetic field of the big bar magnet. And so that's really cool because that's like a physical, visual way you can see this invisible magnetic field. Okay.
So that explains a lot about magnetism. And now we understand classical magnetism and we even understand a bit about quantum magnetism, right? And so now I want to talk about things in the world that are magnetic and that we can use. But first, I want to talk about the most important magnet, which is the world itself. Because it turns out Earth is basically one giant magnet. And the reason that Earth is one giant magnet is because we can look inside of what Earth is made of, right? So does everyone know like the layers of the Earth? Okay, what is the middle layer of the Earth called? Yeah, the core, exactly. So the core has an inner part and an outer part, right? The outer part is actually made of liquid iron. And what's happening over there is that when the Earth spins around, all that liquid iron inside of the Earth is spinning around too, right? And that liquid iron has a bunch of electrons in it, free electrons that are swirling, making these currents. And it turns out that when, a, you know, like I showed you before, when you have spinning electric currents, you create a magnetic field, right? And so that's what those lines are coming in, those black lines coming in and going out of the Earth. That is Earth's magnetic field created by all the liquid core that is swirling around in there. And so you can think of Earth as one huge magnet like this, right? You know, we talk about the North Pole and the South Pole because those are like geographic locations, but they're also North magnetic poles and South magnetic poles. And so anything in Earth's magnetic field, any magnet will interact with it, including a compass, right? So the way a compass works is it's just one tiny little magnet in this little, you know, box, but because any magnet automatically aligns with another magnetic field, that compass will always align with Earth's magnetic field the same way those little pieces of iron align with the big bar magnet. And so that's why you're able to automatically know which way is north and which way is south. And people have been using that for literally a thousand years to find their way around the Earth. You know, no navigation before Google Maps would have really been possible without knowing that basic thing. And so one other really cool thing that's a result of Earth's magnetic field is the migration of certain kinds of birds. So you guys know about bird migrations, right? Birds go from north to south in the winter so that they can stay warm, right? And then they come back up. But how do they know how to do that, right? They don't have Google Maps. But what they do have is a piece of magnet inside of their brains. And that magnet can align with Earth's magnetic field and subconsciously tell them which way is north and which way is south. And that's how they know where to go. So that wouldn't be possible without all this liquid iron swirling around inside of Earth, which I think is really cool. And now there's some other really cool technologies that I want to tell you guys a little bit about too that are thanks to magnets. I don't know. I think there was also a motor demonstration out there, right? You guys might have seen this. Basically, the motor, which is the same way your car motor works and the way any motor works in any kind of electrical thing, is based on using magnetism. You can see that this guy over here has a piece of copper wire, right? Now copper, remember, by itself, copper is not a magnet. But if you twirl it up like this and you connect it to a battery, you'll get an electric current, right? And when you have that current swirling around, that creates a temporary magnetic field, right? Like we talked about earlier. And so he's gonna take this coil and hook it up to this battery, and then he's gonna put it in the magnetic field of that really tiny magnet over there that you can see, which is iron or some, something else magnetic like iron. That's a permanent magnet. And just by connecting the battery like that, he can get the coil to swirl around like this, to rotate super, super fast. And that is based on these two magnetic fields interacting with each other, right? And now you can imagine in a car, you have a really big battery, you can imagine something much more, uh, much bigger than a piece of copper, but if you hook it up and you connect it to your wheels, all of a sudden, this rotation will turn your wheels too, right? And so that's how electric cars work. They have a big battery and the motor will convert the electricity from that battery into mechanical energy that moves your car. So none of that would be possible without magnetism too. Something else that I think is really cool and very futuristic is called a levitating train. Have you guys heard of these before? They're basically super duper fast trains uh, where the bottom of the train is plated in a huge powerful magnet and the track is also plated in a magnet. And so, I don't know if it skipped this part, I think it'll show it. But basically what happens is that because those two magnets repel each other, that train is actually levitating a few inches above the track. There are no wheels involved. It's literally floating there. And so because it's floating, it can actually move much faster than regular trains at hundreds and hundreds of miles an hour, 
many, many times faster than your cars, or even as fast as some airplanes. And because there is no uh, contact between the train and the uh, rail, it never loses energy due to friction. It's much more efficient than most of the trains we use today. And people are trying to adopt this as like a system of trains nationwide in many different countries. So these are the trains of the future, and they would not really be possible without magnets either. Oops. Okay. Now, I want to talk about something. You know, you might have seen magnets and all that stuff before, and you might have heard about motors and, of course, like these levitating trains. But magnets are actually used in a really, really important way that a lot of you might not realize, too, which is recording information. You know, so basically, think about how a computer works. Has anyone heard of binary by any chance? A couple people? Okay. Can someone tell me what binary is? Let's see. Over there? Yeah. Yeah. Like either on or off. Yeah, on or off, exactly. Zeros and ones, right? Basically, the way that we understand English and use that to communicate, computers have their own special computer code, which is all based in zeros and ones. And you can encode any number, any word, any idea into a bunch of zeros and ones. And this is how computers store and process all their information, right? But in order to encode stuff like that, you need a physical way to express zero and a physical way to express one. The way a lot of computers actually do it is with a magnet. If you imagine a magnet whose magnetic field points left and you call that zero, and a magnet whose magnetic field points right and you call that one, then you can string a bunch of magnets together and you can write out anything in binary that you want to into this computer language, right? And so you can even change which way it's pointing, right? And you can change a zero to a one if you just have another magnet on top that interacts with the magnet in the block. And so that allows you to sort of write any information into these physical magnets and read any information out of them too. And this is the principle of how computers a lot of computers store information and store data and tell you about it later. You know, When you write a Word doc or something like that, and then you save it and you open it up a week later, it's because your computer has been holding on to this information about all the stuff in that Word doc in the form of magnets. And so that is also how credit cards work. Have you guys seen that little black strip on the back of a credit card or a debit card? Inside of that little strip, is literally millions and millions of tiny little magnets all pointing in different directions and encoding information about who you are, your bank account number, all the stuff that anybody needs to know anytime you swipe your card at the grocery store or anywhere else where you're trying to buy something. The grocery store machine is reading all that information from that little black strip, right? And so that's why we're able to use credit cards or debit cards or do any of our modern banking at all. It's all because of these little magnets. And so the last thing I want to talk about is what I do, which is quantum computing. And so basic, at a very basic level, I've told you a little bit about regular computers and how they work, right? Either the magnet points left or right, or zero or one, right? You can kind of think of that like a light switch, right? Where it's either off or on, right? Like somebody said earlier, that's how binary works. But a quantum computer is based on using quantum things like an atom or an electron to encode your information. And it turns out when you do that, the atom can be in the state zero, or in the state one, or it can be anywhere kind of in the middle at the same time. And anytime you check to see what state the atom is in, it'll change randomly every single time. So that is, a, I know that's probably a really complicated idea, but it was one of the biggest discoveries of like the last hundred years, that tiny things actually behave in this way. And so you can kind of think of that like a spinning coin, right? When a coin is spinning, it's not heads or tails yet, right? It's not really decided which one it is. It's kind of both at the same time. And when you, you know, slap it down to pick a side, sometimes it'll be heads, sometimes it'll be tails, right? And so you can use that, and if you connect a bunch of different quantum bits together, which are basically different electrons or different protons, you can kind of get them to all talk to each other at the same time, and all their outcomes will be influenced by each other. And this basically allows you to make what's called a quantum computer, and that's the reason why quantum computers are supposed to work much faster than regular computers. So that's kind of what I focus on. And again, none of that would be possible either without magnets. Um, so yeah, thank you. And let me know if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much, Nishad. Okay, any question? We have time for only two questions. So. Isn't technically our brains is like a magnet because 
Um, so when we're like collecting information, it's like waves coming into our brains like a magnet. That's a great question, yeah. So magnets are one type of thing that interact with waves, right? But there are also other things. Like, for example, electrons, you know, they have charge too, right? So they can interact with an electric field or other things that have charge can still interact with waves even though they're not magnets. So our brain has many different uh, electrical signals going on, right? And there are a lot of experiments people have done where you can hook up different parts of your brain to these different signals and you'll see your brain creates a specific electromagnetic wave in response to something that you're thinking, you know? So that's a great point. Our brain is able to create all these different types of signals because of different electrically charged things like molecules and atoms and stuff inside of our, uh, inside of them. Yeah. What is the strongest magnetic field possible? The strongest magnet? Uh, Oh, possible. Uh, I mean, in theory, you can make any magnetic field size that you want to. I think the strongest ones, the field of Earth is actually, not that it's the strongest or anything, but it's a pretty strong magnetic field, which you can kind of get the sense of because, you know, even if it's interacting, the fact that little tiny compasses will respond to it, which have very weak magnetic fields themselves, means that Earth must have a really strong one in order for that to work. But in theory, people in research labs can make fields that are like, thousands and thousands, or even, you know, honestly up to this point, like millions of times stronger than Earth's field. The trick is the stronger you want to make the field, the, the, obviously the more power it takes and like the smaller the volume that you can make it in, you know. So there are like research labs with like huge magnets that are like the size of many rooms this big, and they can create very strong magnetic fields at like very specific points in space. But I, I'm not too sure what the numbers are. Uh, but it's huge. It's huge. All right. Thank you so much, Nashad, for presenting this awesome presentation. And please thank all of our three speakers for presenting their amazing talk as well. One more time.